the Joe Rogan experience. Please explain what uh, this idea of assembly theory. Yeah. Um, assembly theory is born out of an interest in solving the origin of life and finding aliens. So that's sort of the motivation. I think it's really important to be clear about that to start because it introduces some kind of radical reconceptions of the way we think about fundamental physics, at least I think so. Um, but the key idea of the theory is that the universe cannot generate complexity outside of living processes. And so we have a way of formalizing what seems kind of intuitively obvious that the universe doesn't generate complex objects for free. Um, and we do this with this idea of assembly theory, of thinking about the assembly space, which is like the space of all constructible objects. And you can talk about the complexity in that space as a minimal number of steps for making an object. And if you see uh, objects that require a lot of steps to make them and they're in high abundance, life is the only thing that can make them. Wow. Um so this includes plant life, this includes... The everything, te everything. technology, everything on your table, <laughs> you right. know, requires uh, billions of years of evolution, evolution of intelligence and uh, technology to generate. So when you say life to generate, what about like crystals and what about, have you ever seen that enormous cave in Mexico where they have these insane crystal structures? Is that, that are, the one that's like hot inside and like, yes, yes, I have seen that. It's gorgeous. Amazing. I've never been there, but amazing. Yeah. yeah, totally. But it kind of looks like somebody made it, but it's just natural processes. Yes. Um, so I'm actually really interested in understanding to what degree we can consider um, minerals on our planet alive or artifacts of life. Mm. Um, but we haven't formalized the theory entirely for minerals yet. So I think that one of the, the sort of key results we have so far is um, actually quantifying in molecules a complexity boundary above which if a molecule is so complex that we can say it's definitively of life and we've experimentally verified measuring this property of assembly of molecules to say these are derived from life, these are, um, you know, and that there's a clear boundary. Uh, for minerals, we haven't done that yet because we're still formalizing the theory and the kind of measurements we need to take. But I expect there to be a boundary that planets can make some kinds of crystal complexity, but not all of it that we see on this planet. So what is, what's the conventional definition of life? Yeah, so there's a lot of debate about what definitions of life should hold, but the one that is usually cited by astrobiologists is life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And I've memorized it because I find it so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I got it down. I got to know what I'm annoyed with. What, um, <laughs> what, what annoys you about it? Everything. It's like, <laughs> actually, it was, it was very funny writing the book because I wanted to get into the new ideas and... Um, my um, my editor was like, you got to explain how people think about life now. And I was like, OK, well, this definition is the most annoying one. I'll just pick it apart. Um, and it's actually like all the words in it are annoying in some sense. So the first one is that life is chemical. I've never really thought about chemistry being the defining feature of life. I think you have to separate out that life emerges, at least as we understand it, from a chemical soup on a planet. Right. So it emerges in chemistry, but it doesn't mean it's a chemical phenomena. And the sort of analogy from the physicist's conception of nature I could draw there is we don't think that gravity is a phenomenon of rocks. Gravity represents some universal physics in our universe. Um, and so uh, when we're thinking about um, you know, planets and things, we don't think that they obey the laws of gravity because they're made of rocks. We understand that there's some property called mass that's much more abstract and applies to everything. Um, I think life's kind of the same. It emerges in chemistry, but there are some informational properties, these things about how life generates complex structures and how it does that so uniquely um, that is universal physics that happens to emerge in chemistry. So chemistry has to go out. Um, it's not just a chemical phenomena. And I think you need to recognize that if you're going to talk about like technology and artificial intelligence and like are they alive or not mm. because they're very different than – you know, like what's happening inside a cell. Right. Non-biological. Yeah. But still seemingly alive. Yes. Maybe. 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 Perhaps. Yeah. Open to debate. Open to debate. I've said that about technology, that technology does seem to be a life form that requires us to give birth to it. Yes. Didn't uh, Marshall McLuhan I like had, that way of thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Marshall McLuhan had a great quote, and I believe this was in the 1960s. He said that we are the sex organs of the machine world. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Yeah, I like that a lot, actually. I don't disagree with that. Um, yeah. Especially if it does become some sort of digital life. That's yeah. essentially what we are. We're yeah. just by proxy moms. 
We are. So the way that I think about it is to think about life, not in terms of individuals, but lineages. So, you know, there's a lineage of how information has been structuring the material world, what we, what we talk about in assembly theory in terms of all of the configurations of objects created on our planet over four billion years. And that's a process of that's continuous um, with objects making other objects. And there's no reason that that should stop with biological forms of life, and it just moves into technology. So um, I, I like this idea that or the reproductive organs, though, because I always think about, like, societies and, like, global integrated systems as being living things, and we're mm. just, like, component parts of them. Well, they certainly look like it. When you look at traffic uh, from overhead and you compare it to blood moving through yes. arteries— it's really kind of extraordinary. Yeah. Because if you see the ebb and flow of the white lights and the red tail lights back and forth, and then you see s blood cells moving through a person's body, it's kind of similar. Yeah. In a very weird way. And if you think that these cars are all carrying people that are assembling this society, both from the inside in terms of like paperwork and research and all the different things that people are doing, and then the outside in terms of constructing new buildings and putting glass structures and all these different things. Like we really are yes. like some sort of weird, you know, we're like a form of like the city itself is like a living thing that yes. we're making. Yeah, and I think it's really important for us to recognize that. Actually, it's interesting that you, you use cars as your analogy because Carl Sagan actually had like the same analogy. He would have liked that a lot. Mm. Um, you know, thinking about aliens coming to life would have thought cars were the dominant life form, but <laughs> which I think is a great, great, right? Because like yeah. exactly like you're describing, it looks like the, the lifeblood of our planet. And I always think about cities at night as kind of, you know, the key signature of life on this planet. Mm. If you look at it remotely right, sure you can see all, you know all this structure on the planet but right. it is hard for us because we're so you know like so much wanting to think about ourselves as individuals and like the apex of all of the evolutionary processes not to think about ourselves as part of systems that are much larger than us mm -hmm. and i think it's critically important that we kind of change our reference frame on that because we're also seeing right now with like social networks and the influence of like having all these societal level dialogues like brought to every individual and like like we don't know how to process that information yes um but we are part of these collective systems that are much larger than us, and they are constructing a lot of the world around us um, without individuals having, you know, as much agency in that process as we think we do. Yet that process is also what gives us our agency. So it's kind of paradoxical. Right. Right. I've, I've often said that if an alien race that was completely <clears throat> outside of our understanding of life and our understanding of biology, if they observed us and they'd say, well, what is this dominant species doing? Well, it makes better things. That's all it does. Yes. The, the, we do a lot of things, but ultimately those things, even war, which is essentially about acquiring money and resources, we use those resources and that money to make better things. And in engaging in war, you're constantly advancing technology to have an advantage over the enemy. So you're making better things. Yes. Like everything is making better things, which when you scale it up, ultimately will lead to another life form. It will lead to, it will lead to I some new so. thing. <laughs> I think so. Well, if we don't kill ourselves or if we don't get super volcano, asteroid. Yeah, lot, I'm not a pessimist. I think we'll be around for a while. You think but, so? Yeah, but I have a pathology that I'm like really optimistic as a person, so I have a hard time. That's like, good. That's I not know. a pathology. Why <laughs> well, do you think that's a pathology? Um, I think because I think being overly optimistic can leave blind spots, but part of the reason that I imbue so much optimism in my work is like I think we need more optimistic narratives about the future because so many people are really bleak. I agree. I don't think that helps anybody, and I think ultimately most of the things that you're really terrified about do not come to pass. Yes, I think us being terrified of them is like an immune response. Mm -hmm. So usually I'm not afraid of the things that people are really scared of and talking about because it means society's dealing with it. Right. Which I, you know, maybe that's just sort of a scapegoat. I don't have to worry about those things because someone else is. But I think actually there's something rather deep there that like the things that we're trying to work through at this moment in history are being worked through. My and fear about those kind of thoughts is when I worry about things and I say, well, I don't have to worry because society is working through it. I also say, yeah, but someone's probably not and they're, it, they're enhancing the actual threat so they could profit off of it. Which yeah. is, that's another, I mean, that's the military industrial complex. That's a lot of different things. I think that there's a lot of that, unfortunately, that's attached to green energy. I think, you know, the idea of having green energy is wonderful. Everybody should agree to that. But the idea that you're going to give massive corporations this completely philanthropic view of the world all of a sudden, that's not. 
That's yeah, not real. That's no, not real. I know. They make money. They're trying to make yeah. more money. They're going to lie to you. Everyone's trying to make money and get power. And I think once you realize that, like, it's a lot easier to see motives. <laughs> yeah, it's freaky. But that also leads to the acquisition of resources, which leads to making better things. I mean, I am I'm all goo goo. I was reading articles all day today on the iPhone 16. Why? Why do I care about the iPhone 16? My iPhone 15 is perfect. It works great. What's wrong with me? I don't know. But I think that's also built into materialism. I think materialism sort of facilitates the creation of newer and better things mm -hmm. consistently and constantly. Because everybody's like, what do you got, an iPhone 14? What are you, poor Sarah? Yeah. You know, like people get crazy. Oh, I'm slumming it. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? You know how people get weird? Yeah, like, what is your no, car? Two, you have a 2018 car. Yeah. Don't you want a new one? Yeah. Look, they got the new one. The new one has this and that. Has a better gas mileage, faster zero to sixty, and it never ends. And it right. never ends until we create sentient life. I think. Yeah. So you. So you, part of your argument is that the sort of our material, materialistic culture is about building newer and better things, and eventually this is like sort yes. of just more fundamental to the process. of I life. think this pathology yeah. of materialism, this thing that has possessed so many people, where they live their entire lives to acquire things to impress mm -hmm. other people which is a, a huge number of people that are involved specifically in finance, like all, yeah. the, all the amphetamine people, all the people that like to do coke and fucking look at my boat. Ah! <laughs> that, that's what they're doing. They're just constantly getting better and better so things. <laughs> it, it, it does sound boring to you because you're a brilliant woman, but it, it's not necessarily more boring than their normal life, right? Yeah. There's some sort of reward to showing up with a half a million dollar watch on with a, you know, yeah. diamonds and this, this some crazy thing where people go, ooh, he's got that thing. Yeah. Oh, look at those shoes she's got. Oh, right. look at that purse. Oh, look at his car. Yeah. Look at the house they live in. Ooh. Yeah. It's weird. It's I, weird. Well, I know. I sympathize. I am seduced by good fashion aesthetics. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who isn't? But, yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of men aren't, but a lot of women are. Yeah, I love it. I think it's great. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's beautiful. It's an expression of art yeah I mean, that's what it is exactly it makes things look cooler and you know uh, like the way my wife looks at dresses and stuff it's like she's looking at the way I look at other forms of art things yeah, that I like that's right you know yeah. it's just a different aesthetic yep. a different mindset but it's totally art. it is yes. art yes it and is. we are attracted to that too yeah you know, we're attracted to creation we, we, we love when so. people make things yeah and I, I I think you're right to point that this is like maybe hinting at something deeper so you know with this assembly theory stuff my original motivation was really to get at you know what fundamentally explains life in the universe and uh, you know to me the thing that life does that no other physical system does is creativity and uh, life is a mechanism for the universe generating things it couldn't generate otherwise um, and so, you know, one way to think about that is like, like there's a, like this huge possibility space of things that could exist and there's just not enough resource or time for all of them to exist. So by a planet constructing things like us over time, it actually sort of maximizes the number of weird things <laughs> that can mm. be made. Mm. Um, and I really like this. I like, I like this idea, uh, that we're actually really literally the universe's mechanism of expressing creativity and making things possible that would not be possible without things like us. Do you know who Terrence Howard is, the actor? Um, I am familiar with him. Fascinating person. Yes. A brilliant guy who has some crazy ideas. But one of the craziest ideas he has is that whenever a planet gets far enough away from the sun, it will generate life, and then that life will give birth to people. People will eventually yeah. emerge. And he calls it like peopling, like a, pl a oh, planet is peopling. Interesting. And that as these yeah. as these civilizations become more advanced, they're going to have to deal with the fact that the planet is further and further away from the sun. Yep. Like over the course of hundreds of millions of years, right. the, the climate will change. Things will become cooler. They're going to have to figure out a way to develop some sort of an artificial atmosphere yep. or some way of sustaining. Yeah. Along with, of course, biological things that will change yep. with, with the animal as it adapts. Yeah. Um, I have, I, I don't really think that humans are like ourselves as currently constructed are a universal phenomena. I think we're pretty special to this planet, but I think there are certain attributes of humans like you know, the theory of computation and its universality that like we invented in the last century that might be universal to any intelligent species that emerges mm. on any planet. Why so I think you... it's really hard to say like what here is universal to other places versus, 
Yeah. But certainly a big leap, right? Yeah. We have no evidence. Yeah. There's no evidence of people anywhere else. Yeah. Or any other life form. Yeah. No real evidence. There's a lot of shenanigans. There's a lot of weirdness, but there's no real evidence.